Thank you very much indeed. What a timely and important moment. I must say, as I was coming up on the train this morning, I scanned my way through the conference program, just looking at the range of different speeches and contributions and breakout groups and areas of particular interest, and one overwhelming conclusion came into my mind immediately looking at this, that this is a rapidly maturing industry capable of enormous growth and making an enormous contribution to the long-term energy security of the UK and the well-being of citizens here in the UK. And I say maturing not just from a technological perspective, but financially, administratively, legally, the whole array of different services that you know need to come into play in order to make an industry really work, really deliver the benefits of which this one is clearly capable. In short, however people may construe renewable energy, this is a niche no more. This is already a burgeoning contribution to mainstream energy provision here in the UK. Now that is enormously important. In my short period of time today, I'm not really going to be able to take you through all the reasons why this is now so absolutely critical. But suffice it to say that as every year goes by, we understand more and more deeply just how significant renewable energy is going to be to the future of humankind. It is practically impossible to overstate that. If you don't quite believe me on that score, you probably need to spend a little bit of time casting your eye over the recent report, fifth assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This, as you know, is an extraordinary body set up by governments many, many years ago to advise governments about climate change. It is absolutely clear that we still have an opportunity to avoid what people describe as runaway climate change, possibly even irreversible climate change, if, and it is a very big if indeed, if we take the actions that we know are now necessary to decarbonize our entire energy system globally. Not just electricity, but heat and transport as well. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel, spells this all out through three working groups. The first looks at the science, the second looks at the impacts on humankind, and then the third looks at what policy and technology options governments have to address the state of the science and address the impacts on humankind. Because we live in the UK, because a large percentage of our media are still, for some extraordinary reason that many people can't fathom, driven by a belief that there's still a debate about the science of climate change. Most people in the UK still wonder whether or not the science is a done deal. I am absolutely certain that in your working professional lives, you will be meeting a lot of people who still don't quite buy into the idea that our climate is changing and that it's changing primarily because of man-made emissions of greenhouse gases, from coal, oil, the rest of it, and through the continuing patterns of deforestation and so on. There are still a lot of people who feel doubt about that. Now, as you heard from David, Forum for the Future is internationalizing rapidly. Last year I was in India and China, Malaysia, elsewhere. There isn't this kind of debate about the science of climate change in those countries. Essentially, people know that the climate is changing and that we are mostly responsible for that. I'm not just saying that it's the Daily Mail that causes all of these problems, and I'll come on to explain a little bit more why it's not just the Daily Mail, but it is massively problematic to our need to get across the urgency of what has to happen. So the science is spelled out by the IPCC. The impacts on humankind are then spelled out. Those first two working groups are seriously depressing. You don't have to spend very long with them. Just read the executive summaries. And then move on to the third working group that came out just two weeks ago. Two weeks. The sum of six years' worth of work looking at policy, 
prescriptions, technology options for governments to deal with these problems. You may be reassured to know that in its analysis of the world energy system, because obviously the IPCC is looking at this from a global perspective, it talks with huge enthusiasm about the potential for solar industries worldwide over the course of the next 20 to 30 years. Indeed, when talking about solar and the future, it describes solar as the largest by a large magnitude, there's quite a lot of large in there, the largest by a large magnitude of the renewable energy options available to us. Yours is an extraordinary context to be working in. Yes, of course, we're focused on what is happening here in the UK, focused on the potential for growth here in the UK, focused on how to take, I'm going to take David's figure here, the four gigawatts through to 20 gigawatts by 2020, maybe more for me, that's beginning to look a bit modest, to be honest. I don't see why we shouldn't be thinking about a lot more of that, but no doubt the next two days will surface all the reasons why that might be problematic. But this is set within a global context. Everything that you do here through your companies, everything you're doing to deliver that kind of low carbon secure energy into our grid here in the UK is part of this wider global picture to create sustainable energy futures for 9 billion people by 2050. You are part of what is indisputably the single most important challenge that humankind has ever faced. Ever faced. If we don't do this decarbonization story, we are in a lot of trouble. But thankfully, I don't have to touch on that here this morning. So, potential for huge growth. In part, that's why you're here. You know what that potential looks like. You know what is happening now on the technology front. You can see how costs continue to come down, efficiencies continue to increase. You can see the balance now between investment opportunities and support of one kind or another to make all that work. You will be familiar with what David flagged up in his opening comments about high levels of public support for what the solar industries at large, and large-scale solar in particular, are doing here in the UK. DEC's own opinion tracker shows that public support for large-scale solar is now as high as it has ever been. And indeed, that is reflected directly through decisions being taken by planning committees. 81% of applications for large-scale solar successful in 2013. That is the kind of success rate that other parts of the renewable energy business in the UK would literally die for. That's built on trust. It's built on an industry that is carefully working out what its relationship needs to be with its stakeholders locally and nationally. A huge part of that is built around the relationship that you have now with the farming community here in the UK. And I must take my hat off to Jonathan Skurlock and everything that he's been doing through the NFU, building this sense of synergistic benefits coming into farming, into people's local communities, into the UK economy as a whole. It's a hugely important alliance that you've been able to build around that. And it's meant that some of the difficult, spiky issues are addressed full on. There are concerns still out there about whether or not investment in large-scale solar may constitute a threat to the food production capabilities of the UK. The work done by the NFU has shown that that's probably not the most important concern we ought to have about what is happening to land use here in the UK and competition for land and food production. Even if those 20 gigawatts were delivered by 2020, I think the figure of the amount of land involved is not much more than 60,000 acres, 0.01% of total available land here in the UK. It also means that the industry has been able to get on the front foot in terms of quality. The STA, the Solar Trade Association, has been absolutely outspoken 
about the need for not just any old large-scale ground or roof-mounted solar, but quality <coughs> solar. The STA's 10 commitments are enormously important in that respect. The National Solar Center's planning guidelines help enormously to reaffirm the principle of quality. Any of those voices that say we just need to go all the time for lowest cost and bang in the volume and forget the implications of what that might mean, those are dangerous voices that need to be seen as enemies of the successful development of this industry. And in that regard, I have to say I was just delighted to see the new agreements between the solar industry, the large solar industry here, and the biodiversity, the conservation community in the UK. A new agreement signed with all those NGOs, the National Trust, the RSPB, Plant Life, Bug Life, you name it, they were all in there saying, get this right, and this isn't just neutral from an impact on biodiversity, i.e. no net damage, but could be positive, i.e. net positive from a biodiversity point of view. And reading the report that came out to launch that new agreement, I was looking at some of the case studies that lie behind that, some of the early examples that are already out there about how to achieve these wins for conservation, biodiversity, even as we get the, the delivery on the energy that we actually need. And the one that struck my eye was the partnership between Solar Century and a couple of developers, large-scale developers here, focusing on opportunities for the bumblebee. Now, you may think that a keynote speech probably shouldn't delve too deep into the psychology of UK citizens when it comes to the bumblebee, but trust me, the bumblebee is an iconic symbol of our worries about damage to nature and our hopes that when we continue to grow and make our economy work well for people, we do the right thing for the natural world at the same time. It seems a bit odd to imagine a future where the bumblebee is prominently displayed on all the logos and materials for the ground-mounted solar industry in the UK, but don't underestimate the power of what this means and how it speaks to people about wanting to do this in the right way to meet all of these demands. So, huge potential for growth for all those reasons. Now you will have noticed, if you're still listening, you will have noticed that I did not include in my good news stories and opportunities for growth any reference to what one might describe as a clear and consistent policy framework for developing the industry over the next 10 to 20 years. That, sadly, is still lacking. And all of you, as myself, will have been reading with concern about the indications that DEC is about to announce another RO review into large-scale solar. A piece of news revealed first in Business Green and then I'm told, I don't read it myself, I'm told confirmed by no less an authority than the Daily Mail. That sends out ripples of concern. Concern that this government may, for whatever reason one might like to conjecture about, be on the point of doing to large-scale solar what it so idiotically did to small-scale PV back in 2011, 2012. To me, to be honest, this is unbelievable. And if I was a government minister here at this conference looking out at you, at what this industry is doing, I would be checking in with myself to see just how smart it is to let one's policy be driven by a short-term, totally expedient fear of UKIP rather than by a long-term commitment to building the interests of the companies involved in this sector and the interests of the UK over the long term. Now, UKIP looms terribly large, I'm sorry to say. Michael Fallon, in deciding that the Tories at the next election will no longer support onshore wind, there's a sort of 
sad warped logic to that in political terms. When you're in a difficult place with a rival political party, you make all sorts of decisions that are clearly not based on evidence and, in my opinion, not based on common sense. But, of course, this chronic dysfunctionality in this government goes much deeper much deeper than just the problem that the Tories and the Lib Dems no longer agree at all on energy policy. Much deeper than that. It goes really to the heart of how the Conservative Party sees itself and the role that it will play now in promoting a secure, prosperous future for the citizens of the UK. That aside that David Cameron is reputed to have said when looking at what his government wanted to do on energy issues, where he described what we're all passionate about as green crap. That little aside, that verbal mistake, if you like, summarizes a deep contradiction at the heart of that political party. And frankly, the Lib Dems are sort of doing their best to try and rescue us from that profound idiocy but actually they're not doing a terribly good job. So yet again, political risk looms there on the horizon as the biggest problem we face. There are lots of other problems, grid connections, so on. I know you'll be going into all of those in huge detail. But political risk looms as an overshadowing risk that is bigger than anything else that this industry has to do. Sorry to dump that one on you because it's out there and. Hopefully there's much that we can still do to try and offset, to mitigate the degree to which that risk damages the commercial prospects of this industry. We know that risk doesn't help in any respect whatsoever. But my closing comment would be this, very simply. Despite all of that, despite all of this ambivalence, dysfunctionality, contradiction, uncertainty, sad inability to understand science. Despite all of that going on here in the UK still, the direction of travel for the UK now is crystal clear. The direction of travel is crystal clear. We will have to play our part in that accelerated, radical decarbonisation story, just as every other country in the world will have to play its part. We still have the Climate Change Act, a piece of legislation that every other country holds in awe as an example of how to create the right sort of legislative framework to take these decisions over the long term. You're bound to be focused on the political risk story for the next couple of days, but the real thing is to keep our eyes on that longer term horizon. This industry in this country is going to be a massive contributor to what every country needs to achieve as fast as possible, which is as low a carbon set of supply options within a system that is as super efficient as possible, delivering energy in as secure a method as possible, meeting people's needs in the process. That's, that's the deal. And it's an amazing story to keep one's eyes focused on even as we necessarily look to one side and the other to see what the wretched politicians are doing. So thank you for that. I really hope you have a fantastic two days here. And I, for one, will be very interested to see what emerges from this and to hear more about the prospects for the industry over the next few years. Thank you very much.